I'm Wilson Lai. I'm Benjamin Yap. I'm Eli Sams. You're listening to Deep Cut. Ends of the Earth, more like the end of our Kyushu Kurosawa series. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, on Deep Cut, we compare a director's most popular film with a personal favorite chosen by one of us. We also discuss that director's life in Korea to bring context that helps us view the movies as they may want us to. Welcome to our final episode in our Kiyoshi Kurosawa series. If you're enjoying the show, please remember to give us a rating or review and subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. This will help others discover the show. You can also keep up with us at Deep Cut Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. And if you want to talk about this movie with us or any other film, TV, etc., please join us on our Discord server. If you're a big fan of the show, holy shit, we're doing this. We've also recently launched a Patreon if you want to help support the show. You can click the link in our description or you can go to deepcutpod.com to find our Patreon, Discord, and all the other socials we've mentioned here. Thanks in advance if you want to support us financially. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, if this is your first Kiyoshi Kurosawa episode, be sure to check out our others. We have made episodes on Cure, License to Live, Pulse, Tokyo Sonata. And today we end with the most recent Kurosawa film that we will cover, which is 2019's To the Ends of the Earth. Brief summary of this movie, a young Japanese woman named Yoko finds her cautious and insular nature tested when she travels to Uzbekistan to shoot the latest episode of her travel variety show. Okay, let us begin with initial reactions. And I'm going to choose Ben to go first. Oh my god. Why me? <laughs> I'm more excited to hear what you guys think. Because you guys like this movie more than me. And not saying I don't like it. I'm saying I'm really curious what about the movie speaks to you guys more than it does to me. Hmm. I think it's really interesting. And also realizing that it is the only female-centered character story from Kurosawa that we are covering. Which gives us a really interesting bent compared to the others. I was thinking about this because I was re-listening to our episode on showing up because I'm about to watch it again sometime this weekend. And I realized this film reminds me of a Reichert film. Like a Wendy and Lucy, kind of like a road trip movie. Totally. And just like a woman doing stuff, having trouble. Yeah, that's kind of the movie. And that's kind of what Reichert films are like. I found that to be an interesting kind of frame of reference to think about how one experiences this movie. And I think... I would have loved to watch this in the theater. I think we have changed the way I experience it, which is on my TV and a bit distracted. But I would say that the thing that I take away from it that I find really interesting is just what this movie is. Yeah. So for context, it's kind of this movie that celebrates the diplomacy and friendship between the countries of Japan and Uzbekistan. And the fascinating thing is, of course, that these couldn't be two more different countries in terms of culture, in terms of geography. Yeah. The first thing you will learn about Uzbekistan is that it is a doubly landlocked country, which is an interesting term, which I just found out. It is one of two. The other one is Liechtenstein, which means that you are landlocked by other landlocked countries, which means you must cross two borders to reach the sea. Wow. Wow. And Japan is surrounded by water. Huh. So these are two just fascinatingly different countries. And then here's a film about their friendship. But also what's more fascinating is that when you imagine a film about the alliance or I guess diplomacy between two countries, you imagine it's about cooperation, it's about finding some kind of common ground. And it does, but a lot of the movie is about the conflict between culture. And it's about a sense, somewhat of a xenophobic feeling between the two cultures that they can't understand each other. And it is trying to find a middle ground. So in a film that's supposedly founded on the premise of, I guess, friendship and tolerance, Kurosawa goes for conflict, which I think is great because that's from conflict, you can find tolerance and diplomacy and friendship. And I find that really such a great choice that he just kind of goes for that juggler and they let him make it. You know, you see the Japanese characters being assholes. You see the Uzbeks being 
kind of mean as well. So there's like this kind of interesting blend. It's not just like this kumbaya kind of like friendship kind of thing, but it kind of focuses on conflict. And of course, it focuses on one young woman's kind of internal struggles. And I thought that was really kind of a surprising way that he went at this because I had no idea what this film was going to be about. Yeah. So I don't really have like huge thoughts about what the film is really about. Like in the end, it's really just about this girl and she just can't stand what's happening. She wants to change her life. She wants to follow her dreams of being a singer. And I can't wait to talk about who plays Yoko, Atsuko Maeda, which is a very important piece of context. But we'll get into that after maybe I hear about what you guys think about the movie. Great points, Ben. I think like this being maybe the most episodic Kurosawa film that we've discussed on the podcast is Hmm. sort of making connections with with other filmmakers in really cool ways like the Reichardt one. I'm so curious to hear what you thought of this movie, Eli. No review. Five stars. What the fuck? Tell us about it. (laughs) (laughs) I agree with you, Ben, that intellectually, this is such an interesting counterpoint to so much of Kurosawa's other work that we've covered. Whereas in his other stuff, there's a real social pessimism or at least skepticism of what being in a metropolitan social structure does to an individual or can do to an individual. Here, this is like a meditation on travel and what you project onto your surroundings as an individual and how you can learn to approach your surroundings, particularly in travel, in a healthier way, and in a way that is more humanist instead of xenophobic. And also just the interplay of Yoko's experience being the person who goes through that trajectory, while also very closely examining her level of power and agency, both in terms of what she lacks compared to her crew members, who are really treating her as a kind of prop in many of the early scenes, and then seeing how that funnels into how she treats the Uzbek residents around her, and seeing how that changes with respect to how she wields her power and lack thereof as she travels and and interacts with the people around her. So intellectually, this is a very rigorous and well-charted movie, I'm even surprised to hear you refer to it as episodic, Wilson, because though it does move from location to location, it feels like a very smooth trajectory to me. Mm. In terms of the emotion of it, that's where it really surprised me, where Kurosawa loves to be at best sardonic and more frequently cold and, again, pessimistic. Here... It's so surprising how warm this movie is. Even in the moments when things are going wrong, Mm -hmm. there's a real line of sympathy to Yoko, the main character. And that blossoms into seeing her become a fuller person in this really surprisingly musical-ish moment (laughs) about halfway through and then at the very end. Like I was going to put on Letterboxd as a joke, Kiyoshi Kurosawa direct a musical challenge, but he kind of (laughs) did. It's a musical. He does. You're right. In terms of where I I want to like lay some territory to go into, per Ben's question of like what this movie is, I think there's some very interesting answers in the formal choices of this movie. There's a lot of self-criticism about what film is, and it is very tied to this meditation on what travel is and interacting with a new social surrounding. Wilson, what did you think? This is so interesting because this is not what I thought you would say about this movie, but like, I'm glad you you really liked it. You know what? I think that this movie, more than a lot of other Kiyoshi Kurosawa movies, is sort of like a tonal like litmus test as to like how you would take his movies. Hmm. I would not really call this warm until like the end. Like, I think that she's having, like, I'm like, girl, like, come on, like, get it together. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Like, like, she's really struggling. Yeah. So Ben was trying to watch this movie, I think, a few months ago. And I think Eli was searching the the title of this movie in our chat. And um, Ben was asking me, like, what? explain the vibe of this movie. And I'm like, your worst holiday ever or something (laughs) like that. 
<laughs> and I think that like perfectly encapsulates how I feel about how Yoko feels in this place. It is like it feels like she is at war with her surroundings. Mm. While it is not like a supernatural force like many of the other Kurosawa films that we've seen, this sort of foreign body in a unfamiliar land is sort of like acts like a diseased cell that's getting attacked by your white blood cells. It's like it she feels under attack at all times, even though most of the time she's not under attack. Yes. But she feels like she's under attack. And the way that Kurosawa films it is like she is also under attack. So it makes me feel extremely stressed and like <laughs> just very like my emotions are like at a high. And like yesterday, I started this movie and then I like went halfway and then I stopped to go about my day. And I was doing a lot of like prep travel things to like go on this trip on Thursday. And in the morning, I lose my wallet. Oh no. Oh, no. And I'm like freaking out. I spend like two hours like walking around this building in Central where I lost it. And I'm like literally freaking out with all these office workers walking past me, like going about their days. And I'm like, like close to like breaking down and i swear this movie made my day so much worse like this <laughs> my anxiety was through the roof like this the crowds were not making it easier i was not finding this wallet and then i went home still no wallet in hand finished the movie and felt a little bit better but then felt a lot better today after they found it and i got my wallet back oh oh good 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 that's awesome a great ending. And I can travel on Thursday. <laughs> Long story short, this is what has been happening to me, boys. Ooh, it's the same movie. But also directly related to this yeah. movie. So, Kiyoshi, call me. I'll give you my life rights for <laughs> the last 48 hours. <laughs> I think, I, I mean, just to respond to what Eli was saying, I think the filmmaking component of this is really interesting because it is a film about filmmaking. Yes. And about performance. Kind of almost like Kurosami-esque kind of thing. Yeah. And it kind of has that Kurosami feeling of driving in cars, moving through landscapes. For sure. Very brown landscapes. So there is that going on as well. So I think there's a lot here that it tugs on that is really interesting. Well said. Yeah. That's a great link to draw. Totally agree. Okay, I have like the briefest of brief contexts and then we can just start talking about this movie. Cool. But this is interesting because this is also the first Kurosawa film that we've talked about that has been made after 2010. So this is really truly Ooh. Kurosawa in the, the modern day. But this film was made to commemorate the 25th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Japan and Uzbekistan. Hmm. Kurosawa chose Uzbekistan because an acquaintance who was a producer asked him to shoot a film there and he wanted a setting where the main character's daily life was completely different from their surroundings. So that speaks to your point, Ben, about them being direct opposites. So it was also the 70th anniversary of the Navoy Theater, which was built by forced labor of Japanese prisoner of wars after World War II. And that was the theater that Yoko finds herself singing in, in her dream sequence type situation. The whole film was shot in Uzbekistan. Fun facts, actor Adiz Rajabov had not heard Japanese prior to shooting this film. Unreal. No way. And learned all of his lines and was able to speak very coherent Japanese by the time that they were shooting, which is a big feat because I think his Japanese, I'm not a Japanese speaker myself, but from consuming a lot of Japanese, he seems like he spoke very coherent Japanese. Yeah. And also his performance is very emotionally consistent. He's really great, actually. Yeah. <laughs> he is. Kurosawa also said something in this interview about him being really popular in Uzbekistan. He was like a big star there. Hmm. Really? Like he has no letterbox credits, which means that, that he's in a film scene that we have no access to, which is so interesting. Yeah. I don't know if he's like a TV actor or a film actor. Yeah, I also saw that that LB credits, but it's really interesting. He also wrote in the singing after 
Atsuko Maeda Achan was cast in the film. We have to talk about this. Do you want to take it from me, Ben? You should take it from me. So we got to talk about this. So I was clued into this without knowing about it because I followed this person, Natalie, on Letterboxd. We were ex-colleagues and she loves a lot of like Japanese movies and stuff. She does not follow me on Letterboxd. Natalie, follow me on Letterboxd, my God, so I can comment on your reviews. <laughs> anyway, she linked to this great review that talks about Atsuko Maeda, the lead actress, and her fame, and why it's so important to the film and the meta narrative of the film. Ooh, Atsuko Maeda is, or known as Achan, she was one of the f- the first lineup members of AKB48, which I don't even listen to them. I know they exist. They're essentially the largest goal group of all time in Japan, and then in the world, they're like maybe number five. They're like gigantic, but they're the blueprint. Yeah, so this is a girl group that's still around and rotates members. And it's at the start of it, I think there was 20 members. But the whole point was that it would always have about 48 members. Okay? Why? So first of all, 48? it's not just a girl group. It's a gigantic girl group with like sections. So they can perform in multiple places. And it has offshoots in like different countries, different prefectures. There's like JKT48 in Indonesia. Yeah, like it's just an insane phenomenon. And... With that context, she, as one of the first lineup members, she is considered the face of AKB48 when she was there. She was there for seven to eight years. And from Wikipedia, she was known as the absolute ace, the face of AKB, and the immovable center. Because they do these elections in AKB48. It's so fascinating. I did all this research today where essentially fans will vote on who should be like the most important person of the group. And she would win. Oh my god. And that means that she would get the rights to be the leading person singing these songs with like 20 people behind her. Like, she was friggin' famous. Okay? This is fascinating. She's an absolutely ginormous musical star. And it's just insane that he puts her in this film as a woman who wants to sing. And also does not have a super strong, immovable center core. Is really seeking a sense of self. Yes. I think that's the thing that's important when we think about what it's talking about in terms of filmmaking because mm-hmm. idol culture is about performance. Yeah, There's all this stuff about how they had the performance camera and there are all these kind of, I guess, rumors that she's actually not the person she shows on screen. And in this film, we see that in Yoko's performance for the screen. So I think that's just like absolutely so fascinating. And I think we got to like lay it out. If you don't know, and I'm sure maybe some of you will have known listeners, but if you don't know, like it's such a critical component of understanding what this movie is trying to say and why it uses Achan in this role. Yeah, anyway, that's my AKB48 spiel. I don't know anything about this. I am not. (laughs) I'm not this guy, but it's so fascinating. Vote for Ben as AKB president. (laughs) Vote for me as the face of Deep Cut. I'm already in the middle of the the (laughs) podcast cover. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You're the Achan of this of this podcast, man. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Like, I mean, I feel like it's like, if imagine if Destiny's Child had like 20 people in it and she's Beyonce. Like, that's kind of what it is. If you want like a way to like make an analogy for this, for a Western context. It's a great performance too. Yeah, and she's good. And this is, I think, the second or third time she worked with Kiyoshi Kurosawa. She did, I think, trashy one-hour film with him back in 2013. That nobody liked. Mm. It's on YouTube. Oh no. Yeah. And then she did this one, which I think more intelligently in a meta way uses her star power in an interesting way. Anyway, that's my spiel. That's so useful to know. Thank you, Ben. I wish I had (laughs) known that sooner. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's very important information. And just to close this context off, the film was released in Japan on June 14th of 2019 and then did a whole like festival tour because I guess at this point, Kiyoshi like gained international auteur status. So it played at Locarno, it played at Toronto, it played in BFI London, Busan, and New York Film Festival. So a lot of people have seen it. Not as many as our most popular pick, but it is up there in Kiyoshi Kurosawa's films. I think it even has, oh, maybe not a Criterion like release, but it's on the Criterion channel. Mm. I think maybe in the last five plus years, like Kiyoshi Kurosawa's stock has really risen. Hmm. 
Yeah. Right. I don't know why I feel this way, but I just feel it. And yeah, I think maybe it's just a, a general sense of internet globalization and like people searching for different culture to appreciate. And so he's always been plugging away. And I think it just kind of leaked out. And then it's like, oh yeah, this guy's been doing films for a while. And then I think in people's search for diverse film culture, like it, he just kind of appeared. It's like, oh yeah, he's been there. He's been there this whole time. I like that question of like, why now for him? I think he mm. also does speak to this moment really well. Like even thinking about To the Ends of the Earth as being a shortly post-pandemic film is fascinating to me. And just an interesting thought experiment that it's a woman learning about how to step out of her comfort zone and be comfortable with discomfort in her surroundings and be herself in those new surroundings. You know what it is, guys? What? He fits the A24 mold. Hmm. And that's kind of like the cultural zeitgeist we're in right now in terms of indie movies. Like if you really think about it, horror films, but like social thing. I hate it, but I understand. Woman having trouble films? A24. Reichardt's in the A24 stable as well. Yeah. Right? So it kind of tracks for this current cultural moment, but he's already been doing it for like a while. Yeah. I think people are realizing that horror films that you can relate to more than just like surface scares is actually scarier than your regular popcorn horror flick. Yeah. And that has been what a lot of, like, It Follows, like, all the Ari Aster stuff. For sure. Like, all follows this this trend that I think was popularized by Kiyoshi Kurosawa in the international Hmm. art house cinema Mm -hmm. sphere. And I'm sure they've, all these American directors have watched Kurosawa films and have loved Kurosawa films. I don't want to steal the structure of this episode too much, but there are three formal choices that I want to lay out on the table as particularly fascinating. Go for it, Eli. Okay. The first one that I noticed is pans. That there is often a fixed axis to the camera, and it will just pan around, keeping Yoko roughly center frame, surrounded on all sides. Even if it's tracking and following her, she is roughly center frame most of the time. That panning and keeping her center frame, to me, makes her feel lost in those early sequences. Mm -hmm. And this gets broken later on when she ascends the mountain vertically towards the end. And she has a different approach to navigating Uzbekistan. And the camera does tilt at times before that point, but there's the very pronounced tilt up to the clouds and the mountaintops. That's the second to last shot. Am I barking up the right tree with the panning here? Did you notice this? Yeah, you are. I think, generally speaking, because you're talking about camera right now, generally speaking, compared to the rest of the films we've seen on the series, I think he actually uses way more uh, cinematographic tricks in this than the other films. Like, he has a very restrained style, which we appreciate, and It's not a restrained style that's static or that is unchanging. He changes it when he needs to, but he's very selective. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he is also selective here, but he's doing some like fun stuff here. Like he's got a snorri cam going. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, he does. You know, and he's got those letterbox things when you're showing on camera, not camera. The color grade's different. Like there's a lot more going on here visually to kind of create this more modern sensibility of the film in a way that's kind of, I guess, aping TV because it is about making TV. Yeah. But it really feels like... So, okay, if you imagine Kiyoshi Kurosawa and Hirokazu Koreeda, maybe they're not really starting at the exact same time, but they both start an analog film, right? Ooh. And then Kurosawa makes the jump to digital and starts playing more with the tools that he's given and what digital allows him to do and starts pushing limits of things. And then we have Hirokazu Koreeda on the other side who maybe starts fitting into a mold that has been Mm. created by conventional TV cinematography. Not to say that (laughs) I don't love Koreeda, but I think... We all have talked about his sort of house style that he has fell into. 
but we see like two like very formal beginnings that branch out into different outcomes now that they're both in digital. I'm not trying to say anything, but it's interesting. That's a really interesting comparison because I think if you think about them, Kurt Ada is a person who is more focused on emotion and I don't want to say story, but just emotion. Like he has a goal in terms of the emotional payoff he wants from the stories that he tells. That's his main goal. Whereas we know Kurosawa to be a formalist. He's really interested in form. He's a stylist. In sound and image. He's so much more of a formalist. So... Here, like, even doing something like giving Yoko the camera and then using footage from the camera, like, that's very new age kind of stuff. You know, that's very... Mm -hmm. I don't have the right word for it, but it's just what you will see from, I guess, a younger filmmaker. So you can really see the experimentation going on from Kurosawa, yeah. Yeah, you really do. And I think it leads to more interesting work. He's able to branch out and try different things, like make a movie outside of his country that doesn't feel like a TV movie. <laughs> I'm looking at the truth. I'm looking oh. at Broker. <laughs> like, come on. Sorry, man. You're still our number one episode. <laughs> yeah, you, you are. <laughs> but yeah, I think the panning is really prominent in this. And I think it's made even more prominent by... Kurosawa's choice to make this in widescreen in 2.35, yes. like shoot most of it in 2.35, it makes her feel smaller. Yes. Like against her surroundings. And like, yeah, when you shoot a wide shot, obviously there's more space on either side. So you can either fill it with, with people or you can fill it with like really dark shadows and walls and stuff. And Kurosawa always knows best how to fill a frame. And I think it's interesting because I feel like shooting in Uzbekistan maybe gives Kurosawa less control over his extras. But like in a weird way, I thought that they were just Japanese crew in my head, I thought that they just brought the Japanese crew in and then dropped them in some random place in Uzbekistan. But I'm, like, thinking again, I'm pretty sure that these extras were all, like, arranged in a very specific kind of way. But there is, like, a, a unexpected kind of chaos to this that feels even more uncontrolled than classic Kurosawa extras. Like... I don't know what it is, but it feels like this is a document. Like, they're just dropping yes. them in in somewhere. But I think that might be true based on what you can tell. Like, the bizarre scene, for example. Yeah. When she's running around, there's a lot of people looking into our camera that we are seeing into. And I think that means that they just didn't have to care because of the context of this, which is that it's a TV crew, that we don't have to care that the extras or real people are looking into the camera. So there is a very strong feeling, whether on purpose or not, of veracity of documentary like nature, which I think is to the film's benefit because of the content and because of the fact that it's about a TV crew. So I think it really does feel like she's dropped into a foreign country that's not kind of studioed into being like a set. Like it's it's really, she was dropped into it, which I think makes sense or it feels correct. And I think I wouldn't not believe you've told me it was real. I would rather believe that, if anything. <laughs> <laughs> that links nicely to another formal choice that I feel like is so important in this movie, which is that relationship between the TV crew's camera and what they film and what we see of what they film and what Kurosawa's camera sees. Because often, when he cuts between those two, between what the TV crew films and what he, as the movie narrative's camera, is filming it is the same angle, right? Like when she's on Lake Adar or when she's getting off of the ride, it will cut between what the TV camera sees, what they're filming for their travel show, and it is the same angle to the movie's camera, just with a different quality and a different aspect ratio. Mm -hmm. That feels like a very purposeful indictment of the film camera because obviously we're looking at how Yoko is being used for this production and to be critical of that and then link that perspective of the TV camera to the movie's camera feels like 
it's a little self-critical about the nature of film, which links to what we talked about in Cure, that if in Cure, the mesmerism is happening via the film camera, I think this is a conversation we had about Cure, that feels like a similar kind of ickiness about what the film camera can do and how it also uses Yoko and by extension, Atsuko Maeda. I think, I mean, think about that scene when she's on that fun part, right? Oh my oh God. Oh my God. Horrifying. <laughs> that was the first time I was like, oh, fuck, dude, this is not great for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, man, and they just, just being absolute assholes to her, they're like, yeah, let's do it like three freaking times. After the first time, she already said she's not feeling well and they like continue doing it. And I was like, oh man, is this real? Like, this looks pretty intense. Like, what about actual Atsuko Maeda going through this? I thought I about like, that too. Oh, maybe they like had a stunt double, but then it really looks like she did it because of the way that they shot it. I was like, wait a minute. Maybe she's not really doing too hot as herself. And I was like, that's really interesting to put me in that situation as well. There's an audience wondering about the actress's safety as well. That thing doesn't look safe. Just like in Tokyo Sonata, the fall down the stairs, which we thankfully learned was partially digitized. But it looks like you really wonder how much danger is the actor actually in here? Yeah. So unfortunately, Kurosawa answered this question in the Toronto International Film Festival. Oh no. Atsuka Maeda took the ride three times. (laughs) Oh (laughs) my God. (laughs) They filmed it. And he said that the main character's strength mirrors Maeda's professionalism <laughs> in this oh, scene. She's a queen. Oh my god. She's a fucking professional. <laughs> and he told her to act really flustered and out of it by the end of the first go around in the ride. And she finished it and she looked really out of it and flustered and it was way too intense. And she told him after they cut, yeah. I don't think I can act on this one. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. Bro. Oh, my God. Like, I was wondering, were they speed ramping this to make it look more intense? But I was like, it doesn't really look speed ramped. It looks like that's the speed you're being flung. And I was like, whoa. (laughs) It looks horrible, man. Yeah. And Kurosawa does not cut. We see that ride three times in full. In full. He doesn't take any frames out. He wants you to sit there and watch her her suffer. And when the sound guy goes up to her, and I'm like, oh, he's going to ask her how how she is. And he goes, the camera's okay. I was like, what? (laughs) Yeah. B-cam, okay. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, my God. This feels like it is hand in hand with putting the film camera in the same position as the TV camera. And this is even worse because it's making the audience complicit in Mm -hmm. just unabashedly spectating the kind of torture of this actress for real. It feels like a more measured and purposeful version of... Do you remember those Dow movies, Wilson? (laughs) Yeah, I fucking remember the (laughs) Dow movies. It's like that. It's the the director of Beanpole putting a real snuff film in one of his earlier movies. These... Anytime a director makes a purposely kind of cruel choice that problematizes your relationship as a viewer, like really actually makes you do something wrong by watching... It's upsetting and and it often is too far, but it's intellectually interesting. Yeah, and as like the sick voyeurs that we are, <laughs> some part of us is like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm watching this right now. Okay, maybe you don't agree with that, Eli. Okay. I felt very bad. <laughs> <laughs> fine, fine. It's just me. I'm the only sicko here. No, no. If you like cinema, you're a sicko. Unfortunately, we have to accept this. Mm, I think you're right. <laughs> I think now that we're on the talking about performance of Yoko from yeah. Azuko Maeda, I think it's really interesting watching the way she goes from so-called her actual character and then her on-screen persona. Like that difference is so stark and it's so obvious and really interesting because I think usually we get her in those wider shots in 
the film when we're watching her as she is. But then the closer shots might be from that camera angle or when they're mm. doing close-ups of her. But then when you get to the end, that's when you get that real close-up of her when she's looking out into the mountain range. So I found that to be kind of interesting formal art, I guess you could call it. Yeah. To yeah. kind of presenting the way that she is. I really thought the performance was very good. And there is this thing that's going on, which is what we were thinking about with License to Live and other Kurosawa films, which is that there's this sense of the audience playing catch up with what's going on. Like, we don't really know what's going on with her for a lot of it. We don't understand who she's talking to on the phone until halfway through the film, then we realize, oh, it's a boyfriend. And then that becomes a critical piece of the puzzle or the narrative puzzle. And we are learning these things and we don't really know what is her deal. Like, we don't know why she's so frazzled and so like yeah. shaken by everything that's going on. Like I think there's a lot that's left unsaid, which I really like about the way that it, she's treated in terms of how she's packaged for the film, where mm. there are a lot of question marks about who she is and why she's like that. And I think that makes her more fascinating and more fun to watch rather than trying to tell me, oh, because... X happened in her life and that's why she's like, why? She's just like messy, you know? And she's like yeah. <laughs> living her life and just being messy. Goes into her room and immediately collapses, you know? Like that kind of thing. Rolls on the floor. Yeah, it's that complicated in real life too. There's not a one-to-one explanation. Yeah, girl, so confusing. <laughs> oh, that reference. I. I... <laughs> <laughs> so earlier I mentioned that this was the only female-centric film that we are seeing from Kurosawa for the series. Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating that, in a way, he's presenting two cultures that are slightly more patriarchal. Not slightly, maybe not slightly, but that are patriarchal and that have ways of demeaning women. And he presents that in this film. With her Japanese colleagues, they treat her like a prop and they don't seem to really care about her well-being. And she's used because she's cute and she's bubbly and is useful for camera. But they don't really seem to think about her well-being. And we also know what Japanese culture is like. And I think a Japanese audience, which this is more pitched towards, looking at the way that subtitles are done, this is more pitched towards a Japanese audience because the, I'm not sure what the language is called, but the Uzbek people, their language is not subtitled, at least in the way that I watched it. I think their language is Uzbek. I think so. Yeah, I think it's called Uzbek, yeah. So then with the Uzbek people, there are instances where you see how they don't truly really respect women as well. Like when the fishman's like, oh yeah, the fish don't like a woman's smell. And like, yeah, sure, maybe it's folklore and stuff, but deep-seated in that is a certain disrespect for women. And so you have this extremely small Asian girl thrown into this mix of like kind of threatening masculine energy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's immediately, you kind of understand why she's like having a rough time. And I think that kind of feeds into her journey in this film. Yeah. And you can even like see in the way that the extras look at her as she yes. wanders around the city or even the, the towns that she's in. In the bus? Or in the bus. Yeah. I think... Or in alleys at night. Yeah. Yeah. She's really scared of men. Yes. Yes. And it's also the way that they look at her. And I think maybe it is definitely not just this is a foreigner. This is a foreign woman who is yeah. also probably not wearing as much as other women dress in Uzbekistan. So she definitely stands out. Yeah, look at her stature compared to the other Uzbek women we see that are like the feature extras that actually have lines. Like she is such a stark contrast from their body types that like you can feel like, I'm not sure what the right word is, but I guess that meekness and the weakness that she seems to have compared to the people surrounding her that makes it really feel like, yeah, this is a hostile environment I am in. It's interesting when she chooses to seize different forms of agency. One would be choosing to free the goat, despite the fact that it will probably be eaten by wild dogs. <laughs> the goat, bro. She projects a lot onto her surroundings. Like the displeasure that she feels at being used by the film crew seems to turn its head outwards in her skepticism of the people around her. And yes. projection of her own values onto this goat. Literally making a scapegoat of it in like the old biblical sense. Mm. Because she initially thinks the goat is a woman. Or rather it's female, not a woman. Right. <laughs> the goat is female. <laughs> <laughs> she thinks she's going to free it, but really she's putting it into greater danger. Yeah. But in a way, she kind of saw it as a, a kindred spirit, like a female yes. yeah. trap. But then it's male. And then she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I think, Eli, that thread works, but then she sees him at the end, which I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if 
we should have seen that. Like, I think maybe it means a lot for her personally. But I okay, what do you think about her seeing Oku at the end on the other mountain ridge? I think it can be open uh, to whether or not it is actually Oku. And if she has learned to project or if she has learned to avoid projection or just sort of be open with what she's feeling in the moment. And when she sings, finally, the last shot is her looking into the camera lens. So there's no replacement of that lens with the TV camera, which would feel a little bit more cynical. It's like she's Mm. become more comfortable with acknowledging what's in front of her. But maybe the Oku beat at the end is a little bit of doubt being cast onto that. I'm not sure. I see the Oku beat as being very, I think, part of what you were saying, Eli. Like, that's part of the warmth of the movie because it becomes such a nice moment for her. And when it came up, I was like, oh, it's the goat bro. Like, he's here. <laughs> I was <laughs> he's like, oh, he's still here. Sure, we can talk about whether it's him or not, but it's kind of irrelevant because she chooses to believe right. the narrative that she succeeds. Yeah. Right? That's what's important, right? She's like, I did it. I did a good thing. I saved the goat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I feel good about it. You know, and my boyfriend's not dead. Good for you, Yoko. Good for you. Like, maybe it's an admission that there's no perfect way to go about traveling because you're never truly going to be a native of the space and mesh in perfectly because that doesn't even exist for people who live in the space anyway. No space is perfect for anyone. But at this point, she's not making it other people's problem around her in the same way that she was earlier in getting into conflict with the previous owners of the goat and fleeing the cops rather than talking to them, even though that is understandable as a moment of fear. So there's a change, but it's not perfect. The other moment of agency that fascinates me so much is when they give her her own camera to start filming and she becomes comfortable with her surroundings. And at first I was like, oh, this is the progression. Like, this is what's going to make her be more comfortable and gain some power back. And she does get some power because she's choosing what to look at and what to study. But she's still using her surroundings as a resource in the same way that the TV crew is. Like, she's getting the camera up in people's faces. They're doing their work. She's filming their stuff. She's chasing a cat, antagonizing this poor cat, and ultimately filming, I believe, a religious location that she's not supposed to film which leads to the whole chase by the police. Yeah, she found herself back into the system. Like, that's... Yeah, and it it feels like a continuation of this pointing a finger at filmmaking as something that spreads the wrong idea about how to be in the world. I guess it's interesting because we talk a lot about her on-screen persona, I talk a lot about it, and how it's different from her off-screen persona. But then once she grabs a camera and once she's lost by the film crew, she's no longer on screen, but she continues on screen persona. Yeah. Even though she becomes the seer rather than the person being seen. Mm. Mm. And I don't have a point here, but it's an interesting variation where she kind of, by becoming the watcher, is starting to project about the things around her and kind of emanating her energy of this on screen persona onto the things that she's looking at rather than it being coming out of her, which is fascinating. I don't have a point here, but it's just a note. Well, it's just interesting that that leads her into trouble. To me, I feel like her on-screen persona is maybe like a reflection of her professionalism. And I think Mm -hmm. that like professionalism in the face of gender inequality or like I think just maintaining professionalism is something that a lot of people, especially in Japan like sort of put as like the most important thing in their lives in their in the hierarchy of what's important to them and i think to me that feels to me what kurosawa is commenting on or like making a little thing about with how quickly and how like well yoko is at just clicking in and becoming a tv presenter And taking all that shit from her crew. Hmm. And then that is sort of what leads her into the somewhat transgressive behavior once she does have a camera in her possession, unthinkingly. Hmm. Before we started recording, Wilson and I were talking about the moment where she hides under the bridge as a super, super low point. (laughs) 
Why does she do that? Girl, what are you doing? Girl, get out! I actually, as I was watching, said, bruh. <laughs> There's a really great detail when after she gets at the police station, she gets back in the van. She's not wearing socks. I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, damn, I saw that. Because she was wearing these really brightly colored, multicolored socks. And they were not there because they were obviously wet and she threw them away. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah, at the start of the movie, when she goes into Lake Adar, she's concerned about there being a leak in the waiter pants that the crew gives her so that she would get wet. And here she is later on, just jumping in in her boots and socks, <laughs> yeah, hiding under a bridge, getting caught. I'm thinking about that scene early on where they go to the restaurant and demand a meal from... The poor oh, woman yeah. who, who runs the shop who has no firewood. So she serves Yoko an uncooked meal with raw rice. And Yoko's forced to eat that on camera and act like it's so delicious. And I thought it was such a beautiful thread where she finally cooks the meal, gives it to Yoko. Yoko, like, refuses it, but then takes it as takeout. And then alone in her room, like, later that night, like, eats it and, and like, finally gets to enjoy the meal. I think that was just, like, a really brilliant thread there where, like, I think there are moments where she really gets close to connecting with the Uzbekistan people. But maybe not from their side connecting, but like she feels connected. And I think Mm. this is one of the moments. And then maybe another moment is her going into the opera house and seeing the woman and giving, like doing her first musical sequence. That's a great sequence. We should talk about that. Yes, we should. Go for it, Ben. Like that's one of those Kurosawa moments where he's like, some shit's about to go down. Right, And he kind of announces it when she's walking through the theater to get to the stage. And he does these jump cuts of the shot of the back of her head, medium close, yeah, kind of like a medium shot following her. And he cuts her between different spaces, which are the different spaces we, we hear about later on from Timur about the different rooms that are built by Japanese people. And she's like one minute space. And we don't really see the space that well, but we know there are different spaces. So when he does that, he announces like, oh, something's going to happen. Then he gets her into the theater and then... And then you hear the sounds of the footsteps. Like they're rhythmically continuing on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. And then when she gets into the theater, then it looks realistic. But then the light starts looking a little strange. Hmm. It's almost dreamlike, but still maybe in the realm of reality. But a bit stylized. But then you really enter an actual dream sequence or projection sequence where she imagines herself singing on stage like it's just a great sequence classic Kurosawa setup with great payoff and uh, I'm just imagine knowing that she's a singer in real life and then seeing that happen like must have been amazing I find the song interesting because I feel like am I supposed to think of this movie as a romance but the guy is just not seen because she sings of this love that can sort of transcend everything like i think one of the lines is like i'll betray my own country for you right it's very like intentional words professing love and i'm like yeah i can feel it but i never i don't even know what this man looks like like (laughs) but i feel her desire for him even if we do not see him at all through this runtime It's so weird in this beautiful Kurosawa way. I don't think she sings for him, is my feeling. Mm. Like, I think I never felt like she was singing to or about somebody. It felt more like she was singing for herself, I guess. Mm. Considering that we know she has this dream to be a singer. That the performance felt like it was something that she wanted for herself. And so even at the end, even though we get to that final scene after finding out boyfriend didn't die... That singing felt like, oh, kind of like the world's my stage kind of feeling. And because she's kind of singing to nobody, so that means she's singing for herself, if anything. Hmm. The you she's singing to is flexible, it seems. I'm fascinated by how the space that she walks into and the type of song that she sings is kind of Europeanized. 
in presentation. Like, even hearing the opera performed is of a European kind of milieu and the opera house space as well. I mean, the song is European with Japanese lyrics. Well, that she's more comfortable in that space feels like an underscoring of her unstable personhood and searching for an identity elsewhere, right? She mentions that she doesn't keep in touch with her family from Japan at all. Mm. So searching for an anchor feels like part of what leads her into conflict in the new land. It's very hard to wrap your head fully around this. I think there are some Kurosawa movies that I'm able to like really crack, but this feels like a tough cookie to crack. But I think that's what interests me so much about this. Yes. Like, it's not clear. But what is there to crack? Like, I think it's a pretty simple movie at the end of the day. Yeah, but I want to crack why I like it so much. Like, I want to oh, understand. Okay. <laughs> that's a good line of questioning. I, hmm. Maybe it's just vibes. It could really be just vibes. I think that could be it. Because, I mean, if we think about the Reichardt comparison, com- Reichardt movies are kind of just vibes. Hmm. They're like, okay, it's, this one's about friendship. This one's just about being lost. Like, if you think about Wendy and Lucy, this is probably the closest to a Wendy and Lucy. Kind of a road trip movie. Woman lost. Doesn't know what the fuck's going on. That kind of feeling. And because I think it feels genuine, even despite all that meta stuff, like, it feels genuine and it's playing all those tricks. It's not just a vibes movie slash uh, episodic film about women having problems in her kind of day-to-day life. It's also, on top of that, this film about diplomatic relations as well as a film that hmm. comments on performance with a star that is a performer. Like, I think the fact that he layers all these things on it make it a very interesting, kind of remarkable little thing. Like, he made something really simple a bit complicated. Totally agreed. It might be my favorite Kurosawa now. Damn. <laughs> Whoa. Damn. Damn. This or Pulse. That's pretty awesome. (laughs) That's great to go out on as well. Yeah. Yeah, True. That is true. And certainly is most optimistic. Early on when we started the series, Eli said, I think Kurosawa could be one of my guys. Oh, he absolutely is now. (laughs) Absolutely is. Awesome. Well, I hope we get to cover more Kurosawa in the future. He has three movies coming out this year. Uh, ben and Ben and I have seen one of them, so I think maybe that's in store in the future. Maybe before we close out on Kurosawa, the chime. Here's the chime. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> before we close out on Kurosawa, I just wanted to shout out a film because watching this film reminded me of another film, which my friend made. My friend's name is Sean Neo, hmm. and he's. Feature debut came out last year. It's called My Endless Number Days. Also Japanese. And it's about a Japanese woman figuring her shit out. So if you like the vibe of Ends of the Earth, like I think there's some value in trying to seek out Sean's work because it is kind of cut from the same cloth of like a woman figuring stuff out, being in foreign countries, not knowing what's going on, being a bit lost, being put in stressful situations. So I think something to seek out Sean, if you're hearing this, there's your shout out. (laughs) Awesome. A deep cut for a deep cut. Yeah. I love Mm. it. So let's close out on Kurosawa. Let's shall. Yeah. For now. (laughs) Let's shall. (laughs) I feel like I sort of said my final thoughts. Do you have big takeaways from this series, Ben and Wilson? I'm just thinking about how we have our work cut out for us if this man just keeps pumping out movies. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, this man don't stop. (laughs) I think it's a similar thing to if we ever do Hong Sang Su, which I am dying to do. Um, (laughs) But (laughs) it, like, yeah, I am so excited to dive more into Kurosawa's work in my own time, go through his filmography. There are still so many movies that people have talked so highly about. I know Keith Christian, who's our friend, who probably doesn't listen to this podcast, but (laughs) I'm still shouting him out. He's a massive, massive Kurosawa fan. So, and like everything he's watched is like either a four and a half or a five. Which is maybe not saying much for Keith, but it is. (laughs) I still trust that, so I will. I will follow in your footsteps and tackle more Kurosawa. I feel like what's really fun about this series is that we, the five of us, kind of came into Kurosawa, kind of not like at a high level of understanding. 
Yeah. Yes. And then through watching and talking about five movies, we really went on a very tandem journey together to understand what this man was about, which is really fun. Because usually it's like, oh, one of us is a quote unquote expert or more passionate about the filmmaker and is introducing it to the other two. But this yeah. one, it was like, we're all like, Kurosawa's kind of interesting. Should we check him out together? And then we did that. Love and that. then that felt really, really fun and interesting. And what's also fascinating is that we covered three out of five non-horror movies. Yeah, true. Pretty sweet. Which is, that's the deep cut special, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's what you get when you listen to our podcasts. <laughs> we're genre bending here. That's yeah, what we're doing. Uh, like we like the stuff that's not what you think. Very fun going on this journey with you all. Even then, those three also share a lot with the other two that we talked about, Kill and Pulse, which are decidedly more famous movies from Kurosawa's filmography. Okay. Thank you for listening to this episode of Deep Cut. Please rate and review because that helps us keep making the show and helps others just discover the show as well. Be sure to subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts so you'll know when our next episode drops. Keep up with Deep Cut on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd at Deep Cut Pod. You can also join us to talk about movies on our Discord server. We now also have a Patreon. If you want to support us, please do. We deeply appreciate it. You can click the link in our description or go to deepcutpod.com to find our Patreon, Discord, and all the other socials we've mentioned here. Deep Cut is hosted and produced by us, Wilson Lai, Benjamin Yap, and Eli Sands. This episode was edited by Buchar, and our cover art is designed by Justina Yam, and our theme song was composed by Eli Sands. I'm Wilson. I'm Ben. I'm Eli. Take care, and we're looking forward to talking about more movies with you next time. Bye.